Tony. I am a GRCC, although it was JC in my day, alum, a native Grand Rapidian and co-founder of Fubble Entertainment, and I am thrilled and honored to be interviewing today Cambry Cruz. This is so exciting. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, a little bit about Cambry, and I had to cull this from <laughs> the information about this woman because she is just magnificent and has accomplished so much. She is an accomplished storyteller and public speaker. Uh, her many appearances include uh, stops at the Moth Main Stage and Upright Citizens Brigade, comedy club stages, countless schools, book festivals, events. She is the owner of a PR and production company, Ballyhoo Promotions. Yes, ma'am. And uh, she specializes in comedy. She brings the funny. <laughs> she is a writer, a producer, and a publicist, and she is the author of Burn Down the Ground, a memoir. And we are so thrilled to have her in studio with us today. And I have been asked to spend about a half hour with you, and I can tell you after <laughs> reading your book and visiting your websites and your uh, videos on the web, we could, we could spend a lot more time than a half an hour because you have just such an incredibly rich and interesting story to share. Mm -hmm. uh, from every facet of your life. So I'm so excited and, and I hope we, we get um, a good sense of who you are because I think your story is so uh, important. Yeah, my um, mom never, uh, she said, I never sent you to college, but I gave you an interesting yes, life. Yes, so you that's did. what we get to talk about. That's great. Um, well, the first thing uh, before we start, I noticed in one of your performances you said, people always ask me if I sign. because So before we get into you even telling me what this is mm -hmm. and, and teasing people with the fact that you do sign and what that means to your life before we get into that. Um, um, can you tell me, because you wrote about it so beautifully in your book, how you sign, how your family signed your name? Is it a nickname or? Oh uh, no, my name Cambry is my given name, right. K A M B R I. But when I was a baby, I never cried, and since my name starts with a K, this is my sign because this is cry and this is K. So Cambry. Isn't that cute? It's adorable. Yeah. I was trying to, well, I, was, I was in my home reading trying to figure out how yeah, that Yeah, Cambry. Would be they also called me Motormouth, which when you live in a deaf family and your nickname's Motormouth, that's saying something. <laughs> yeah, yes, it's fantastic. So we, we're going to need more than 30 minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's good. I'm, I'm good with that. I, they can, we can just, you know, do the John Stewart thing and go, you know, cut to the, yeah. for, the for the rest of the interview. Um, do share a little bit about, um, your book, Burn Down the Ground, and, and the essence of that story before we get into some of the other questions? The nutshell, the elevator pitch is that I, I grew up in the woods of Texas, the deep, isolated woods of Texas, uh, at one point living outside in the woods, tents, and then a tin shack without running water, electricity, no plumbing. Uh, we got a trailer, but it got repossessed, so we moved back into the shack. And then eventually we moved to Fort Worth where my father attacked my mother, an event I witnessed, which turned my life upside down. I ended up getting married at 17 to a man in the Navy. And then 14 years later, my father uh, attacked another woman and is now in jail for 20 years for attempted murder. So that's the elevator pitch. <laughs> and as you can see, I, it's, the, it's comedy. I bring the comedy. Which, hilarious, right? Yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> hilarious. In fact, you know, it's so interesting. I've, I've, I've got some cheat, cheat notes here. Uh -huh. um, and I'm going to dive right into the book and some of the things that just really jumped out at me and resonated with me as I was reading. Um, one of the first things uh, is in the context of it, there's several places in the book where you share deep-seated fears of being exposed. You, the, the story of the tub where you had to, you just talked about the shack where you had to take a bath with a sheet between you or the, um, the stories about your father and his behaviors at the mall mm -hmm. or um, hiding maybe who your dad was from, from a boyfriend. And mm -hmm. so there was all this, I kept reading, I was mortified at this behavior. I didn't want anybody to know who I was. So how do you go from being this kind of fearful, my words, on some level, child and young woman to, blah, this is my yeah. life, here I am. I mean, was there an aha moment? How, when did you say, I have to tell my story? Well, you know, there aren't, uh, as a teenager, you just want to be normal. And my father, my family was not normal. And so that's where that shame and the fear. And also my mother, unbeknownst to me, had been being uh, abused by my father for most, uh, most of her marriage. And she had kept that from us um, because they were deaf. We couldn't hear them fighting. They couldn't, and they fought behind closed doors where I couldn't see them. So um, she had taught me 
in direct ways and inadvertently how to um, keep secrets and to not tell the world what was happening. Don't tell anyone we smoke marijuana. And as a child of deaf adults, I was their interpreter. And so I was always told what to say. You tell them I said this. Don't tell them I said mm. that. And I'm constantly being told how and what I'm allowed to share. And uh, years later in New York and wanting to tell this story, there's also the element of my mom's story that she was abused. Mm -hmm. And for us to finally be able to tell the truth, bare bones, that it removes the shame and the stigma that she carried around for so many years. And so to take the story, to be able to tell it the way I remember it, is to take the power out of everyone else's hands and put it back into my own. You can't tell me what I'm allowed to say anymore. You can't tell me how I'm allowed to sh share it, what I say exactly, and to take away that uh, control that my father always had over us. Mm -hmm. He's very charismatic, very manipulative, as are a lot of abusers. They convince you, and they're very convincing uh, after you've been abused of how uh, much they love you and how guilty they are and how, how they deserve your forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so just to take the power away from him and to put it back into our hands was So was, was there, I mean, when, at what point did you start to write? Um, I had been blogging when blogging okay, started. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I would just blog little short entries here and there, and I always felt very comfortable in my own voice of just sharing my life. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, and I had a lot of readers. Um, I, I always was afraid of writing a memoir because I thought it had to be literary, and this is so important, you know. And I'm like, I, I never even went to college. I, I'm not capable of writing this. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is I had been training myself in ten years of blogging how to write. I, I was a writer. I wrote every day. Right. That's what a writer is. Right. Yeah, but um, I, was a, I was a little daunted by the memoir process, but thankfully it's, I got over it. <laughs> I, I love that you said that in, uh, a few pages later here in my notes. I've actually written, um, the book itself is very literary, for lack of a better word. <laughs> I mean, it, I, mean I, I took away from it. Is, I, that's all I could come up with, so it's so funny that you say I wasn't literary. It, it strikes me as being very literary, just in terms of, the different, this is very process question, mm -hmm. but in terms of the styles that you chose and well, how you tell your dad, I mean, did and you? And there are literal and figurative, there are, uh, there are symbols, snakes are an ongoing symbol. The burn down the ground title, mm -hmm. burn down the ground is a figurative and literal title. The literal meaning, when we moved to the woods, it was snake infested forest. Mm -hmm. We had to clear the land and agricultural technique is slash and burn. So we slashed down the, the woods, burned the ground, and the ash is meant to serve as fertilizer mm -hmm. for your crops. And for us, it was to clear the snakes as well. Um, so there's the literal version of it. And then later on, when we moved from Montgomery, we burned down the ground again and left uh, all our, the belongings we weren't allowed to take with us, we burned those up. But then the figurative, the metaphorical meaning um, is about burnt offerings and absolving one of your sin, yourself of your sins. Um, and, and also that our mistakes are really this burnt, scorched earth. And we can look at this as just this ugly, scarred land or past, or we could look at these mistakes as the ash that are meant to serve us and nourish our future. And did these themes, did, did these themes come out of working on the book, or did you... No, they came See out them going I, in. No, it was a process of just writing the truth and how it happened. And it was like, um, and I had even read uh, Stephen King's On Writing is a really great book for mm. the writing technique, but it's also a memoir, his memoir. Mm -hmm. But it, there's lots of great advice. And I remember, I'm pretty sure it was his book where he mentions that don't try so hard to make symbols and metaphors and all this literary right. stuff. They come out naturally, and he was right. They really did. It, it all felt very natural. It was such a rich story. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and one of the things that I, that I was um, contemplating as I was going through this, I mean, this is, this is a story about... You and your father, no mm -hmm. question. This is a story about being the child of deaf adults. Right. This is a story about poverty and alcoholism. Um, I believe your words were something to the effect of this is um, society. I think I wrote it down because I, I just I read it and it just um, the role that society, family, and the justice system had colluded to give your father keys to worship. Mm -hmm. um, the ability to laugh in the face of tragedy. And then I yeah. wrote forgiveness. Is this a story of forgiveness or a story of acceptance? What, 
What is it for you? Uh, I think those go hand in hand. Um, I had, after my father attacked my mother, I felt like my life was ruined. I never went to college, mm -hmm. even though I was primed and ready and should have. I should have gotten a scholarship, but I didn't know how to ask for help. My mom had taught me very well to not yeah. talk to people and tell the truth and ask for help. And so I was bitter. I was angry for many years. And interestingly, the other attack on this other woman that, the father, that my father's now serving 20 years for, um, that is when all that buried pain was resurrected. And I, for the first time, as a mature adult, where I, living in New York and having happiness, having found happiness in a career in a, that I liked, and uh, now I'm in a happy, good place. And I'm able for the first time to deal with all that buried pain. Mm -hmm. And that's where I found acceptance and forgiveness, for sure. Writing the book was after. I think that you can't write a memoir when you're still feeling those emotions, mm -hmm. because otherwise you're, you're trying to settle a score. Or you're, you're, not, you're not seeing the, everyone for who they are. And all of us are flawed. All of us are capable of evil and greatness, and that's who my father is. And I think uh, if after you read the book, you really do feel that. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating how you humanize all of the people in your stories mm -hmm. so that you can connect with them on a... Their, yeah, their motivations. Why do they behave yeah. the, same, the way they did? If I were trying to settle a score, it would just be like mommy dearest, and that's just awful. Well, you know, there's... there's <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's been written. <laughs> um, it, there's uh, the 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 your mom. I mean, your mom to me also is such a fascinating dynamic mm -hmm. in terms of this. And you just spoke a little bit about that. Um, I I don't. I the, I guess the question there with your mom is maybe gets to that forgiveness and acceptance too. How much did this process change your relationship with your mother too? Because you certainly have compassion mm -hmm. for her. But where is, yeah, well, how's I, that dynamic? Because well, you talk I a lot about changed, your mom hiding stuff, too. Yeah. And I had, uh, when I blamed her, and I think of my behavior in blaming her, the victim blaming is very typical, and I'm guilty of it. Mm -hmm. I blamed her for not leaving sooner. How could she be so weak? And just that mm -hmm. anger and bitterness I, I took out on her, as if she had tried to kill her own self. Right. And it was my father who was the criminal, not her. And so it really, uh, by studying domestic violence and doing the research on the Violence Against Women Act, mm -hmm. which wasn't enacted until after my father's attack on my mother, several years after. So in studying the Violence Against Women Act and just doing fact checking and background research, I came to a place where I understood that she wasn't unique. She's a textbook case. Mm -hmm. And that's sad. But it's also important to tell the story. Well, and you talked about, um, with me earlier, um, and I think for benefit of people watching, it's important. You, you talked about um, the hiding in the deaf community, the, mm -hmm. the, the face that the community puts on to protect its own. Right. Can you, especially as part of the diversity lecture series, can you speak a little right. bit to that? Um, people think deafness and sign language is really exotic. I mean, <laughs> they see people signing and they're just so fascinated by it. And it is a beautiful language. I wanted language. to see Cambry. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful language. It mm -hmm. is interesting. But at the end of the day, it's a language mm -hmm. and a culture. That makes it very similar to any immigrant family who's come here and English is the second language in the home, or even a second generation family where the in the home, the, the first language, be it Korean or Russian or whatever it is, is what's spoken in the home. They still observe two different cultures, American culture and then the Russian or Korean culture or whatever. So sign language and deaf culture are very similar in that regard. Um, what is the same about them in, in terms of domestic violence or drug and alcohol and mental illness and, and any kinds of troubles mm -hmm. that happen at home, there is a pressure to maintain the uh, positive image of their tight-knit community. Um, uh, I met a Korean woman whose father uh, definitely did not want her to share a story. She writes only fiction because of it, mm -hmm. that he's like, no, 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 it'll make us look bad. It'll make the Koreans look bad. And there's that pressure. But then also, say you do want to go get help. You're not able to just walk into the local women's shelter uh, or a, the health facility or mental health facility and say, I need help. Because they don't have just a Korean interpreter waiting there mm -hmm. for the next customer. And so 
you don't have the resources available and there's this pressure. And then also in those tight knit communities, everybody knows everybody's business. And there, if you want to leave your husband, you should just be able to leave him and go out and forge a new life for yourself. Right. And it's not that easy. Yeah. And you talk immediately, like I think even in the first chapter, you address your mom right away going, how do people know about Ooh, this? Yeah. Let's put the kibosh on the, mm -hmm. on the yeah, gossip. Yeah, my father had been cheating on her. She found out, uh, and this was uh, apparently a repeat episode. And um, her, the, her insistence on wanting to maintain a great image in the deaf community, uh, it ruled a lot of her decisions, mm -hmm. some for the bad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, switch gears just a little bit. Um, and talk a little about your comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, having uh, my own personal issues with my own mother, <laughs> uh, who is since deceased, and uh, <laughs> there was a part of me, and who also likes comedy and is very drawn to that, there was a part of me for a time that actually thought that if I healed my relationship with my mother, that I would lose my comedic edge because all of these comedians have such, so many comedians have tragic <laughs> lives, right? you know? Right, they do. Um, and, and so, I, I just I thought of that as I was kind of reading through everything that you've dealt with here. Has your comedy changed through this process, or has any part of you changed because of it? Well, that's part of actually how the story ended up coming about, the book ended up coming about, because of the, the peer pressure from the other comedians. When they, uh, My husband's a comedian, mm -hmm. and he would tell at little networking parties or whatever, he would tell other comedians my story that nutshell mm -hmm. that I gave you in the beginning, and then people's eyes would uniformly bug yeah. out, jaws drop, yeah. and they're thinking, you're sitting on a gold mine. <laughs> you're wasting this material. Um, uh, and also, the deaf community is a storytelling community. ASL is not a written language. Mm -hmm. So performing uh, kind of came naturally to me in telling the story. Um, but uh, as far as the, the humor changing, I wouldn't worry about that because um, you know, my father, uh, now that I've got this great relationship with him, I mean, the, the humor goes on. He writes me letters. I'm seeing him Sunday. I'm going to visit him. Trust me, there's humor yeah. still to be had. That's so funny. <laughs> but, yeah, there was, there was a point in your, um, one of the, the, one of the uh, stories that actually made me laugh out loud was your humor in dealing with the deaf community and you and your brother trying to make your mom say words that... <laughs> Mississippi, <laughs> yeah, Mississippi. Because your always... mom has some ability to... My mom actually ability, speaks right? very clearly. Oh, okay. She was born hearing, a hard of hearing, but her parents were both born deaf. Her sister was born deaf, all her aunts and uncles. Um, so she, like me, is a child of deaf adults, like Coda. She was in, in charge of the family, negotiating on the phone and, and interpreting in adult situations. Um, but by the time she was 13, she went to deaf school. That's uh, where all her friends and family were, but also her grades had started slipping because she was not able to keep up in hearing school. But for those first you know, formative years, Linguistically speaking, especially those first five years of a child's life, she was able to hear mm -hmm. and therefore able to speak and speaks very clearly. Yeah. She, um, yeah, and this and 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 the humor also, uh, which is found on the pages here, which you, I mean, like I said, I laughed out loud in a few places, and you, you know, the story can get so tragic so quickly. It's <laughs> like that when you're talking about, and I won't give anything away because people have to get this, um, but the time at which you're having. Um, an amazing night out with a famous billionaire, and then that last little, yeah. while well, this was happening, something else was happening in another part of your life. I mm -hmm. mean, you have the ability to turn a corner on somebody very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, well, and that was my life, though. Yeah. That, I mean, of all the nights uh, I, I had learned of my father's arrest, I was out with a billionaire. Like, who does that? I, I don't even know why I was there. It was just so strange, and it was this amazing, amazing night where I felt like, oh, I've, I've done it. I, I made it. This is it. And, then, and that's honestly how um, my father has always influenced our lives. And now that he's in jail and has been in jail for 10 years, it's been normal for a while. Mm -hmm. So when he gets out, what happens? And when is he, so you said 10 years, when is he doing? He just was denied parole in okay. June. Okay, okay. Totally normal that he was denied parole okay. because it was his first time eligible. Very rare. And he's had some scuffles on the inside, right? Years ago. Oh, okay. He's been okay. pretty straight for okay. a, a good chunk. Okay. I would say at least five years, maybe right. even longer. Okay. Um, 
but he's eligible again in two years. So now that the book is out, he's read it. I was going to say that because yeah. you read it. Yeah. He, I'm seeing him Sunday, so we'll talk and hash it out. Uh, but my hope is, is that now that the story is out there, the truth, it's cliche, the truth sets you free, that maybe he can now look at this blackened, scorched mm -hmm. earth that he's left behind as an opportunity for him to take the ash and nourish his future. He's got a great opportunity ahead of him because of the book and because of the truth finally being out there. When you, I saw something online, uh, I believe it was a moth performance, mm -hmm. uh, Blind Ears. Mm -hmm. uh, it looked like it was relatively recent. Mm -hmm. yep. um, when you get to the point at which you're talking about your, the attack that you experienced with your mother mm -hmm. um, from your father, uh, it is gripping in its emotion and watching you perform it mm -hmm. is very powerful. And it's almost like, you know, the edge is right here, mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever that edge is, and you've got it right about here. Mm -hmm. Is where does it stay during the day? Does it stay, or is it in you anywhere, even, or is it perform? I mean, what? Yeah, I, it's not even something I think about on a daily basis. It's not something I carry around anymore. Like with the visit going uh, coming up mm -hmm. uh, Sunday, I don't see my father very often. He's in Huntsville, Texas. I live in New York City. Right. It's not the most convenient place for him to have gotten punished. <laughs> um, yeah, why couldn't he kill somebody up here, closer <laughs> to home? Um, so he, uh, you know, now that this visit is coming up, I've got him on my mind a lot more. Mm -hmm. But when I think about just uh, family on a regular basis, it's more to send postcards. I've got a purse full of postcards that I want to write and shoot off to them and stuff. It, uh, it's so far in the past. Um, and the, the dreams, the bad dreams that I had, I, they don't, they, I don't have those anymore. So does it's it gone. feel more like performance to you than, than as a performer and as a storyteller, yeah. there's... Maybe it's always the same. I, mean, I don't. It, um, I, whenever I uh, told that story for the moth, the moth is such a special organization, mm -hmm. and they really do want you to tell the story without notes, without too many rehearsals and mm -hmm. stuff. And that story isn't one that I've ever really told. That was only my second time telling it out loud. So and you were able to do it in 14 minutes, which yeah. is <laughs> crazy to go on that journey with you. And it was this you. amazing auditorium filled to the rafters. It was like a thousand people or something crazy. Yeah, so the adrenaline and the pressure of a thousand eyes or two thousand eyes <laughs> on you telling this very raw story for the second time in your life. It's not hard to tap into that. For me, anyway. yeah. Well, yeah. it was it was very beautiful and poignant, Thank you. And, and you're right. Not everybody knows what moth is. I mean, it's yeah. an NPR. It comes out birthed out of NPR, right? The, uh, the moth.org, and just today they announced that they're going to have all their stories for free on their feed. <gasps> on the, oh, fabulous! Yes. Yeah, fabulous. So, and their YouTube channel is wonderful as well. That's great. Um, the uh, speaking of moth, speaking of it, uh, storytelling. How important is legacy? This is just kind of a broad question because mm -hmm. you've told your legacy. Have you? Do you have any sense of how important that is for anybody else now that you've done it? Well, uh, I'm not having children. Mm -hmm. I don't. Have, well, at least not that I know of. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, so this is kind of my baby in that sure. sense. But I do have two nieces, my brother has two girls. They um, don't know sign language. Uh, they haven't been raised in the deaf community. So for me to preserve the history of that, that, that moment in time where deaf people didn't have the Americas with, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act on their side, but while technology was was being created, uh, cochlear implants were starting to become popular in the 80s, and the early 80s, and they're still experimenting with that. I, I'm, I'm really happy to have something that I can pass to my nieces and also to preserve that history for my grandparents and, and the struggles that they went through. I mean, they were deaf in the 20s, mm -hmm. and can you imagine what their lives would be like now with FaceTime? You can have a phone call right now and just talk into your iPhone. Just that, that right there is astounding. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the picture you paint of the deaf community is amazing. Do you do, you do I know you're involved with CODA, I mm -hmm. believe it is. CODA. CODA. Yeah, Children of Deaf Adults. Okay. Um, are you involved politically? 
at all in terms I've of... I've gone to uh, Deaf Hope, which is a great okay. domestic um, abuse uh, group geared towards the deaf community. They're based in California. National Black Deaf Advocates have had me speak at their events. It's more about telling the story to make sure that there's some awareness to remove that shame and stigma that we've talked about, especially the older generation of deaf, uh, capital D deaf, not lowercase deaf. De capital D deaf yes, is, so what is, uh, what, 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 is where you're culturally deaf. Uh, oh. Lowercase d is just the inability to hear, the actual, huh, okay. yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, uh, we have just a few minutes uh, left here, and when I look at your life on paper and on the web, on the World Wide Web, um, you have accomplished so much. I mean, you are a writer, a storyteller, a producer of comedy, uh, <laughs> um, a businesswoman, really. Who are you first? Are you any of I those know. My, first? My husband's stepbrother was like, wait, are you sure you haven't been to the moon? <laughs> are you sure you haven't done that yet? Because I'm actually thinking, now that the book is done and uh, the comedy club that I was doing PR for, they, they closed, which made my little sub venue that I had in the there, that had to close as a result. Oh. Yeah. And now that this book is out and I don't have plans to write another one anytime soon, I do have another one in me. I do know that. Oh, great. Um, I'm like, what do I, what do I want to do now? I don't know. I thought about maybe I could be a journalist. I, I also thought about maybe going to to learn how to be a police officer, going through their training. I don't know. It just seemed kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me because yeah. it'll show up and, you know, a police officer. Maybe what I could do is run for city council. But in New York, I could because I, I inhaled. You know, wanna, so yeah. I think in New York I could get away yeah, with Don't that. do that in Grand Rapids. No, get, no. I don't think you'll get far. Although so, there is a big <laughs> movement to decriminalize. We are on Community College Network, so we can talk about that, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's because we are on Community College Network, um, why is speaking to college students so important? You do so much speaking in schools and, and maybe love close it off with... speaking with students because they are ripe for the message to uh, of, and they're at this critical uh, time in their lives when they probably have made some mistakes they're ashamed of, especially I always looked back on my junior high years when I had done some really terrible things. I vandalized a friend's home. I got hauled off to the sheriff's station for prank calling. You make dumb mistakes when you're a kid, and I beat myself up over those things, and I carried a lot of guilt around and shame, and now I realize, no, I, if I just owned it, tell the truth, the truth sets you free, uh, that those are mistakes and I learned from them. And that's, a, that's the, the positive thing, is you learn from your mistakes and that's that ash that you use to nourish your future. But um, also for the junior high kids especially, because they're just about to turn into where life gets really complicated mm -hmm. in junior high and high school, um, about the choices that they do have to make in their lives. My brother made some really terrible choices consistently. Mm -hmm. And that's where we had the same parents. We lived in the same tin shack. Our, the trailer that got repossessed was his too. Mm -hmm. And yet he flunked sixth grade. He never took school seriously. He never took advantage of the free um, programs in school like I did with the right. theater and things like that. We, and he had uh, opportunities to make better choices. And I just really hope that the kids can maybe see this as an example where they can choose for the better, hopefully. It's, oh. it's wonderful. I, it's, it's very inspiring and, and uh, so important, the work that you've done. And clearly this, I don't know if you, and I don't even have time to ask you this because we're oh. running out of time, but I would love to. So um, I, we'll, we'll have to go to cambrycruise.com, mm -hmm. right? And, and lovedaddy.org, am yep. I right on Love that Daddy. for your Org blog? It's got uh, pictures and drawings from my father from prison, yeah, in yeah. letters. Yeah, um, and and uh, I just want to say thank you so much for bringing your story uh, with us here in Grand Rapids. Uh, I think you have so much that can resonate with so many people on so many different levels. We don't all have dads in prison. No, there's <laughs> universal truths to all of our families, and we all have more in common than we think and that we know. Yeah. And with that, thank you to Cambry Cruz. Thank you. Thank you.